Good evening, Rabbi We're going to talk tonight uh, some interesting pieces from the Zohar Kadosh, the Holy Zohar. This is our 18th installment of uh, pieces from the Zohar. So we're getting to Chai, you know, Chai. 18 is Chai. So that's a good sign, Baruch Hashem. We should have many, many more. But anyway, it says that over here in, in Parshat Truma, the Zohar Kadosh, the Holy Zohar, Dav Kuf Memchet, something very interesting. It talks about something which comes from the Pirkei Avot. It says in the Pirkei Avot, in the fourth parak, like this. It says, Heve zanav la'arayot ve'al tiye rosh l'shu'alim. Interesting idea. What does that mean? Right? Be uh, the tail, better to be the tail of the lions than to be the head of the foxes. Right? So what, is, what does that mean? What is, the, what is the meaning of that? So the, the simple meaning is like this, right? That when you're studying Torah with a group of people, uh, so what happens is that you can choose to study with people who are on a high level, you know, chachamim, great people, people who are very learned, spiritually very high level, or, you know, there are those, those little guys, you know, the ones who are spiritually very, you know, not so, not so uh, advanced, right? Very, very simple, very, you know, pashut, very, you know, not, not on such a high level, very low people, not, uh, not the impressive spiritually. So says, uh, says the Pirkei Avot, better to be the tail of the lions, what does that mean? To go with the lions, the strong people, the ones who are spiritually very, very strong and very high, better to be with them, to go with them, than to be the head of the foxes. The foxes are considered to be the ones who are spiritually not so high. Right? The spiritually midget, midgets, you know, spiritual midgets, whatever, whatever you want to call them. So the point is that better to be the tail of the lions than to be the head of the foxes. You know? So it's always better to be with the lions, the ones who are great in Torah. So according to a simple meaning, what does that mean? What that means is that a person should always strive to be with big people in Torah. Why? Because over there, he's going to learn from a lot of things that he didn't know. They have lots of knowledge. They have lots of you know, things to teach him, whether it's by teaching or by example, the way they behave and so forth and so on. So therefore, they're going to get, he's going to get from them a lot. He's going to enrich himself with all kinds of spiritual knowledge, all kinds of... Uh, right, uh, wisdom, and so forth and so on. So therefore, it's better to be with them. You're going to get more benefit from them. And even though you're going to be in the back seat, you know, and you're like, you're not considered to be so important. Over there, you're not a big shot. There are people who can, you know, put you in the little pocket, right? You're, not, you're nothing compared to them. But nevertheless, you're going to get benefit from them because you're going to learn from them. On the other hand, if you're going to come and be Rosh the Shu'aling, what does that mean? You're going to be the head of the foxes. You're going to sit with people who are not knowledgeable, you know? And over there, you're going to be the big shot. Why? Because they, you know, you're the only one who knows anything. You know what I mean? So they're all going to be like listening to you. You know, you're going to be at the head of the table, and they're all around you, you know, like this. You know, and they think you're a big rabbi. You know, and this, that, you're teaching them and uh, whatever. So that's not so good for you that you're teaching people like that. What's the reason why? Because these people don't know nothing. You know, so therefore they have nothing to contribute. They have nothing to teach you. And also they're, they're spiritually not on a very high level, so they don't understand. You know, like you tell them concepts all kinds of things, and they don't know what you're talking about. You know what I mean? So, so what that means is that uh, a person should not want to be like that. He doesn't want to be the, uh, the, the tail, uh, the, the head of the foxes. Even though he's at the head, he's at the head of the table, but what is he really getting from them? Not much, right? So, okay, that we can understand. You know, it's pretty logical and uh, you know, pretty simple, straightforward. But the question is like this, right? Does that apply like all my life? What does that mean? Like for instance, you know, let's say, okay, I, I went to, to, to learn with the lions, you know, the great rabbis in Torah. So I went over there to Jerusalem, I learned over there, I was sitting, sitting there for 20 years, and now I want to come back, you know, and uh, teach to the, the simple people, you know, to educate them in Torah. So it's considered to be something really, really good. Why? So then, right, is that now that I've already studied with the lions, can I now come, come back and now be the head of the foxes? Right, this is the question. So what's, what's the answer? The answer seems to be that even then it's not really so good. Even if you already studied and you already are very knowledgeable, still to be their head, to be their chief, you know, hancho, whatever, head, head of the rabbi, not so good to be like that. Why? Because it doesn't make any exceptions in Pirkei Avon. Say, oh, okay, once you become a big rabbi, then come and teach them. You know? So why then, then what's, the, what's the reason why? Why should you come and teach them? What's so wrong with being there, the head of the foxes at that time? So, you know, uh, in the Zohar Kadosh, he explains this 
right, uh, on a deeper level in order to understand this whole thing better. This is what I wanted to explain to you, right? Uh, first of all, you know, I want to tell you that regarding being the head of the foxes, this is also brought down in halakha, this concept. What does that mean? Says the Rambam that there are, you know, these young rabbis who just got out of the yeshiva, you know, 20 years old, 18 years old, you know, teenager, barely got, you know, his feet wet, just got married now, you know, whatever. And now he thinks it's a big shot. So he comes and sits, you know, with the Ami Aratzot, the simple people. And he teaches them all kinds of things. And they think he's very knowledgeable, you know, and they think he's like a big shot. They don't really know who he is or what he is, whatever, because they're not knowledgeable enough to know who they're dealing with. So what happens is that they think he knows a lot, but the truth is he doesn't. He teaches, he teaches them the wrong halacha. Whatever is asur, he touches them, it's mutar, right? Whatever is forbidden, tells them it's permitted. Whatever is permitted, tells them it's forbidden. He doesn't know so well, because he's not, not experienced enough yet. This is, the, this is the thing, you know? So because of that, says the Rambam, these rabbis who do this kind of thing, these young rabbis, they come and teach them like this, and they're not enough experienced yet to, to do that job, because mm-hmm. they're too young. So he says, they're destroying the world, the Rambam says, these kind of, these kind of rabbis. Maharim et ta'ulam. What does that mean? They're teaching people the wrong halakha, you know? Whatever is allowed, they say it's not allowed. Whatever is allowed, not allowed, they say it's allowed. Everything, they say the opposite. So it says, Ramam, they're destroying the world. This is also brought down in Shulchan Ruch, in the laws of Talmud Torah, in the laws of, uh, in the Ramah. In Talmud Torah, he brings it down too. He brings this Rambam. So what does that mean? That halakha says like this, you know, there's a Gemara, in Masechet Abu Lazara. It says that a rabbi, or anybody, whatever, whether he's a rabbi or not, He's not allowed to pass in halakha until he's four years old. Not allowed to formulate the halakha until he's four years old. What's the reason why? Because it says right in Pirkei Avot that the, the, the 40 is the age of bina, of understanding. When a person reaches the age of 40, he already starts to understand things better, you know, on a deeper level, a more, you know, profound way of understanding things, uh, and is more comprehensive, more well-rounded understanding. Uh, so therefore, right, says the Gemara, until he's 40 years old, not to So these young, young rabbis, what do they do? They come and pass in halacha, they teach them the halacha, whatever they think is right, even though it's not written in the poskim, it's not written in the books like that, they're just guessing, you know, basically. You know? Oh, I think it's like this, you think, but can you bring a source for that? You know, do you Why have... can't they go back to the, the source? And, and, you know. Yeah, it's true, but you know what it is, right? There's two, two, two answers to your question. Number one is that they're too lazy to look in the sources, and they don't, they don't even, sometimes they don't even know where to, where, where to look. They don't have enough experience to know where to look, to where to find it. You know, they're still young kids, you know what I mean? Just a teenager, just or 20 years old, you know, 25 years old. Still too young to pass in halakha. So that's one thing, right? They don't even know where to look, they're, and they're too lazy to do it. And also, there's another thing. They think that, you know, like they understand without that. They don't have to look. I mean, you know, they think they understand arrogance. everything. You know, what I mean? arrogance, right? That's what it is. That's what it is. So they have this arrogance, you know, the young people, the young kids. And they think they know everything, they understand everything. So what they do is, they, also they read between the lines. What does that mean? Even though it says in the book like one thing, but from that they do something else, you know, from there. And they think it should be like that, but it's really not like that. So they're not exactly saying what's in the book itself. They're making an inference from the book to deduce something else. Which is already like your own idea. You know what I mean? This is not something which is written in the book. This is what they do. So therefore, right, says the... Uh, says it says as uh, a this is very dangerous to do such a thing like that this is exactly what we're talking about also in the Rambam in the Shulchanuch, as we mentioned that a person should not do that uh, because he, until he's 40 years old he doesn't have understanding Gagibar, you know Gagibaraks. that's the idea right uh, there's one exception by the way to that rule you know first of all I'll tell you something interesting right it says in the Agada in the Pesach Agada there's one rabbi over there Rabbi Al-Azhar ben Azaria it says Hareni Keben Shiv Im Shana what does that mean that he was just appointed to be the, the head of the high court, this rabbi. But what happened was that he was only 18 years old at that time. Teenager, you know? Can you imagine? And he, they appointed him to be the head of the court. Why is that? Because he was very learned. He was very wise. You know, usually on that, at that age, they're not so learned. But he was an exception, you know? There are exceptions also to the rule. He was very learned. So what Hashem did was, since they, they wouldn't respect him because he's very young, so he came that day that he was appointed to be the head of the Beddin, and he made him look like older, you know, gave him gray hair, gray, you know, like a big be- gray beard. Gatetra, you know, look, you know, told his papa Gatetra, you know, like that's why he, he turned him into, a, you know, like a snowman. So he made him into all white and everything. And that's exactly what he, what he says over there. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like 70 years old. What does that mean? I look like I'm 70, but I'm really 18. That's what he was saying. 
Ah, so how do they make him the head of the court if he was only 18 years old? But we just said you have to be 40 years old. Right? The Paskin Halachot. Then how, how did they do that? Also, right, there's many other cases like that as well. Uh, you know, like my rabbi, Maran Lava Shalom, Maran Ovadia, he uh, was pa- also, when he was very young, he was Paskin Halachot. He was writing books in Halacha already. So how was he doing that? He wasn't yet 40 years old. He was only 25. You know? So how did he do it? That's the question, right? What, he didn't know this Gemara? He didn't know the Shulchan Aruch? He knew. But the answer is like this, right? It says in the Gemara, there's one exception to that rule. You know what the exception is? If there's no other rabbi bigger than you in that place where you live, so then you're allowed to. If you're the biggest guy over there, right, that's all they have. You know, they have nothing else besides you. So that's a very different story. But if they have somebody bigger than you, you shouldn't open your mouth. You know, keep your mouth shut. And let the big rabbis, you know, talk, talk about these things. It's not for you. So, uh... That's the exception to the rule. But nevertheless, right, this is a halakha. Okay, fine. So, okay, that's beautiful. But anyway, nevertheless, right, once I became, let's say, already 45 years old, 40 years old, I already studied Torah for 25 years, 30 years I studied. So I, I come back, you know, and uh, now I teach them. I, okay, so I became now the head of the, the foxes, you know? So what's wrong with that? But Pritki Avot says, don't do that. Right? Why? So it says Zohar Kadosh explains something amazing about this, right? something a little deep. It says over there in Zohar, Kuf Memchet, that when you, you know what it is? When you become the tail of the lions, you're the tail, which is not exactly the best part of the body. You know? But nevertheless, you're a lion. You know what I mean? You're still a lion. So therefore, a lion is a lion. You know? And that's why it's better to be like that. Ah, but when you're the head of the foxes, Right? Even though you're the head of the foxes, you're still a fox. You know what I mean? So therefore, you're like still, you know, pretty, uh, you know, disadvantaged over there. You're, you're, you're like not so qualified. You're, you're not so prominent being a fox. So therefore, it says in Zohar this is the reason why. You know, you should never want to be the head of the foxes. Because you, that makes you also into a fox. Mm. <laughs> you understand? But when you're the tail of the lions, you're also a lion. <laughs> that's the difference, you understand? So, uh, with this, bearing this in mind, right, what does that mean, practically speaking? So it says in the why? what's the reason, by the way, why a person, when he gets educated in Torah, why wouldn't he want to be the head of the foxes? Okay, I'm also a fox, but at least I'm teaching them Torah. What's the problem? You know? So it says in the the problem is like this. When you're a fox, right, and you're with the foxes, there's a problem over there. The problem is that the forces of Tumah, of impurity, have over there access, you know, to, 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 have, you know, to, 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 to take from there. So what does that mean? You're never going to have really, like, uh, satisfaction, you know, like, uh, real, real, uh, you know, pleasure from being in a group like that. Because there's always going to be over there undercurrent of forces which are not evil, are not good, evil forces. Because over there, you're, you're with the foxes. The foxes are not the forces of evil are, str- are, are strong there. You understand? Because they're spiritually very low. Yeah, they have their place there. <laughs> yeah, everybody's got their place. You know, that's, that's the way it is. Yeah. That's the way it is, you know? But the point is, right, that this is the reason why the Zohar Kadosh says, you, don't, you never want to be the head of the foxes, because that also makes you into a fox. And therefore now you're also in that environment, which is, yeah. you know, impurity there. Right? Achizat klipot. that's the way it says in the... Uh, Right? What does that mean? That the forces of evil are also strong there. They have strength there. So you don't want to be in that group. So where do you want to be? You want to be with the lions. Why is that? Because over there, the forces of evil don't have power. Why is that? Because they're so strong, spiritually, really high. They don't allow, they don't, it doesn't, doesn't go by them over there. It just doesn't, doesn't come into the picture. You understand? But this is the reason why it's better to be always with the lions and never with the foxes. Right? This is the idea. Okay, this is a very interesting uh, concept. It really is uh, quite deep if you really think about it, you know, and uh, there's a lot of uh, ramifications that come out from that in practical life. You know, which, you know, uh, like what I mean to say is that you never want to be like in a bad group of people, you know, and become like, you know, the head honcho there because you're the only one who knows anything, you know. In other words, it's not a good idea to be like that in a situation like that because when you're, when you're in a bad group, a group of foxes, what happens is that, uh, you know, you're also caught into that web of impurity there, which always 
exists with the foxes. Okay, that has a lot of ramifications. Very interesting. Uh, another interesting thing I want to tell you uh, is what the Zohar Kadosh says about the issue of Gainam, you know? So what is Gainam? Gainam is the, what, you know, what they call in English, you know, purgatory or or hell, right? Whatever, whatever you want to call it, right? So what is this place? According to the Torah, according to Zohar Kadosh also, what is Gainam? This is a place where people are punished for their sins after they die. You know? Um... So the way it works is that they're punished there for a certain amount of time, depending on how big their sins were. You know what I mean? Uh, and there are some unfortunate ones who stay there even like forever. You know, like for, they, never, they never get out of there. Some of them get out in a short time. We're talking about like right away. Some of them get out in a year. Most of them probably, right, are in that category of getting out within a year. And this is the reason why when we say Kaddish for the deceased, we say for a year. Because for that year, they're, they're there. You know what I mean? So we want to, Kaddish saves them from a the punishment. This is the reason why we say Kaddish. But not everybody winds up there, ultimately. Right, the truth is, you know, as, as, the, as the Chazal say, pretty much almost everybody, almost everybody, like, you know, 99.99% has to go there for some span of time in some, some kind of, uh, right, in some kind of... Uh, uh, some, some some kind of role he has to have over there, you know, to, to be in that place. Some kind of scenario. He's going to be there for some kind of scenario. But they say, by the way, something amazing about that. You should know that, uh, you know, when it comes to Tamil Chamim, so they say that, uh, you know, if they had some sins, they're, you know, Chacham, so what do they do? They take him to Gainam, you know, and they pass him over there, but the flames of Gainam cannot burn him. Why? Because the Torah protects him. You understand? So he just passes over. You know, but he sees what's going on there, and like, you know, he gets, he freaks out. You know, because it's very scary. You know what I mean? Once you see the situation over there. Ah! You know? So it's like a lot of suffering to just to look at that, to look at that situation. But he doesn't get burned himself. You know, they pass him over, and then he goes out. Right? But the truth is, it doesn't explain everything. This, what I just told you. Why is that? Because there's also another group, which is the rabbis, you know, who like became derelict, you know, renegades, you know, like Yeshu, you know, people like this, right? The people, you know, the, the people like this, students of Torah who be, became totally derelict, derelicted, you know, and they went off the, the they went off the path altogether. So what happens with them? You know, because would would that be enough just to, to tell them to go over, you know, and the and the flames of Torah? The flames will not touch him because he learned Torah. Would that be a suitable punishment for him? Not really, because this guy already became like totally corrupted. You know what I mean? So what do they do to a person like that? Something amazing, right? It says that since the flames of Gainam cannot touch him because of his Torah that he learned, so therefore what they do is they first they make him forget the Torah. What does that mean? Comes an angel, you know, and makes him forget the Torah. And only then, when he forgets the Torah, now they can punish him in Gainam, fully, for his deeds. You know, they can only do that when, when he, he's, his Torah is gone. As long as he still holds on to his Torah, they cannot, they cannot burn him. So that protects him. So therefore what they do is they, they make him forget. Right? Actually, there's a, there's a real case like this, a real life case that is recorded in the, in the Bible. Where do we find this? We find this in the Sefer Shmuel, in the book of Shemuel, where it talks about, about the king of uh, King David over there, life of King David, David Amelech. So what it says over there is interesting, right? That in that generation, there was a few big chachamim, you know? But several of them are, were corrupted rabbis, you know, like very corrupted people who lost their portion in the world to come. So two of the most famous ones, who are they? They, they were Achitofel and Doeg Adomi. Right? So these two were like big chachamim, really huge people, you know, like top of the top, you know, not like these foxes over here in, the, in the, right, this area, right over here. I'm not talking about people like that. These were lions. You know what I mean? you know? So these guys, they became corrupted. That's what happened with them. You know what I mean? So once they became corrupted, what happened was that um, they sinned. You know? 
And because they sinned, they did very big sins. So what happened was, Adol Gadomi, he sinned against David HaMelech very, very gravely. What did he do? He spoke Lashon Hara about him. You know, he slandered him. What does that mean? That Shaul, who was the king at that time, was chasing David to kill him. And he, saw, he, told, he told Shaul, Doeg Gadomi, I saw him over there, you know, this and that, whatever. So, you know, he, he helped him to, to, to try to catch him. And this caused people to die, by the way, because, because of the battles that were going on. Right? The, the Kwanim, the, the priests were killed over there in that place. So what happened was that many people were killed because of Lashon Hara of Doeg Gadomi. So Kadosh Baruch wanted to punish him. You know, but he had a great amount of Torah. So what happened was he made him forget the Torah first, you know, and then he punished him. And there's actually a scene like this in the book of Shmuel where it talks about this. What happens is that there's a certain battle where Shaul now dies, right? The Palestinians, the Palestinians come, Palestinians, right? They come and they killed Shaul. So what happened was that uh, uh, at, in that battle runs a certain boy, you know, to David HaMelech. He tells him, oh, you know, I saw what happened. The Jews lost the war. The Philistines who gained the upper hand. And Shaul was also killed. He died, Shaul. So he asks him, he says, how did Shaul die? You know? So in the end, this kid admitted that he killed Shaul. Why is that? Because Shaul told him, right, I want somebody to kill me because otherwise they're going to, like, you know, afflict me. Once they capture me, the Philistines, they're going to afflict me. So therefore he said, you know what? Kill me, you know, take a sword and kill me. So this guy says, I took a sword and I killed Shaul. So once David hears that, right, he, he kills this guy. You know, he said, how could you kill the king? Kill the king, you know. Uh, so uh, he said, how could you kill the king? So he killed him because of that. He punished him with death on the spot. So before he did that, you know, before he killed him, he said, you know what, I want you to tell me, who are you? You know, like you're coming to report something about the war. Who are you? So he says, I'm a son of a convert, for, converted from Amalek, Amalek. Amalekite convert. Who was this? This was Doeg Adomi. This is who he was. So the question is, right, how is it that he just said, you know, I'm a son of this. He didn't say I'm a Doeg Adomi. Why did he say that? Because he forgot who he, who he was. You understand? What happened? The Lord made him forget the Torah. So therefore, once he forgot the Torah, then he was killed and punished for all his sins. So what does that mean? That a Tamit Chacham shouldn't think that he's got get protection by becoming corrupted, you know, because he learned Torah. They'll get him too. What does that mean? First they'll make him forget the Torah, and then they'll punish him for his sins. So nobody's immune. That's the idea, right? You shouldn't think that, uh, right? Also another thing, right? You remember one time we discussed this. This is something which resonates in your head, I'm sure, uh, right? Very often that we talked about the punishment of Yeshu, right? So we over there, it says in Masachet Kitim, that it's the boiling excrement, you know? So that, uh, that uh, concept of boiling excrement, apparently it's something which is also some, somewhat profound. There's no accident over there. So it says the Kadosh, regarding that, who gets the punishment of boiling excrement? This is somebody who caused people to sin, you know, on a large scale, you know? Like a person who, you know, renegade, you know, heretic, who called people to, caused people to go off the way, to, to make them lose their the path in life. So a person like that is a, who's a big sinner, like Yeshu, so people like that, they punish him with boiling excrement. So this is Rakadosh, uh, why, why excrement? Because excrement is something like, you know, disgraceful, you know? So since a person, uh, and by the way, what's the reason why in Gainam they punish people by fire, you know? By boiling, by fire. What's the reason for that? Why not some other kind of punishment? Because, you know what they say, right? That uh, uh, the sins, a person who ha has sins, the fire of the Yetzirah is what causes him to sin, you know? That he has that fire burning in him. He wants to go and sin, do some, you know, go and do, do that, go and do this. So therefore, since the Yetzirah is a form of fire, so therefore they also punish him with fire. So it says in the Rakadosh that the, the, the Yetzirah, the Gainam, the purgatory, the fire over there is fueled by what? It's fueled by the fire of the Yetzirah that we have inside. If there's no Yetzirah, there's also no Gainam. If there's no Yetzirah on us, because that's what makes the Gainam function. The fire of the Yetzirah, which is in our hearts, which is in our bodies, which, in, which is in our, in our, in our uh, souls. So what happens is that uh, this is the reason why they're punished like this. So it says to Akadosh, a person who gets his punishment, boiling excrement, he never gets out of Gainam. He stays there forever. You know, it's like a, it's a perpetual thing. 
he never gets out. Why is that? Because since he sins so greatly by causing others to sin as well, and you know, he sinned like very, very deep, you know, like he went very far, you know, like he just went out of control, you know, like this guy, you know, you have your friend from Yellowstone over there, you know, same, same type, type of character, you know, one of these people, they just have no, they just like have no, no bounds, you know, like somebody who just goes all the way, no, no shame, no nothing, you know, no, uh, nothing, nothing holds him back, you know, he'll do anything, you know what I mean, that's the idea, so if you have a person like that, he never gets out of gain now. that's the idea, right? So the, the Zohar Kadosh talks about this uh, quite, in, uh, quite in depth over here. So it's a little bit scary, but it's just unbelievable. The, the uh, yeah. punishment yeah. is for the very wicked that yeah. you know, we learn. Your soul doesn't exist. After. Your, your soul perishes. Right, there's a certain kind of perish kind of thing over there. It's true, it's true yeah, what you're saying. It's gone, yeah. It's gone. yeah. You you destruction. Make it to that. Right, destruction. Right? So this is worse, actually. Yeah. <laughs> right, because it's like perpetual, yeah, perpetual, perpetual punishment. Suffering. Right, you, it never stops. Right, yeah. that's the idea. Yeah, you know. Yeah, in a way, it's like being in solitary confinement. Right, exactly. Right? That's Rather the idea. Being put to death and, and right, you know. But you know, the truth is that whatever you can imagine in this world, right? They say the gain number sixty times more, you know, intensity than, than whatever you can be punished over here. You know, and there are people, by the way, who may say, "Oh, you know, this sounds like a fairy tale." No. There's a there's a purgatory over there. There's a there's a gainam in the, in the in the belly of the ground inside. You know, How can it be such a thing well, like that's that. That's where they got you know, it from. We don't they, they well, probably got it we from don't know we don't know about that. Right. So what didn't the, didn't the archaeologists find it yet? Uh, whatever you know. So the truth is, you know, uh, the, the proof is in the pudding. And every time you see a volcano that opens, you know, and that fire comes out, it's coming from gainam. That's what the Hazal say. That fire which comes out of the volcanoes, it's the fire of gainam. So if you think there's no fire inside in the earth, right? Think again. There is a fire in there. <laughs> you understand? So <laughs> I think that's, what, that's pretty. That's, that's where our uh, <laughs> brothers uh, got that concept. From. Well, whatever. You know. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. They yeah. stole everything. You know. They're thieves. Yeah. Okay. So uh, look, look what it says over here regarding that, right? Zakadosh. I'm going to read this to you. Kevan deit bere adam. So what happened was, right, that Zohar Kadosh says, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu created Adam Arishon, the first man, so he created him straight, you know, holy, good, you know, everything was good. So what happened was that even though he was straight and good and holy, Right? But he corrupted himself, you know, by having this curiosity to see what's on the other side, you know, side of evil, eating the forbidden fruit, right, all kinds of things like this, that whole concept. So what happened was that because he had this curiosity to go to the side of the evil and see what's going on over there, so what happened was that Kadosh Baruch banished him from the Garden of Eden, right, banished him from there, kicked him out. That's what happened, right? And it's still there, by the way. The Garden of Eden is also underground. There's Gan Eden over there, and there's also Gainam over there. They're both underground. It's still there. It's just that Adam Arishon was banished from there. So we can't go back in there until, you know, we first finish our lives over here and we do all the things that we have to do. So then a person who merits to go back, he can go back there. You know, if he has enough merit to do that. So it says like this, right? Gan Eden ihu be'ara natia be'inun natia denata lekul shabrihu kemad yata mer ba'ita adonai Elohim so he says there are also right angels over there in Gan Eden who are guarding that place, right? You can't go in there. They don't allow you in. If you try to go in, they'll kill you. That's the idea, right? So it says it's in the belly of the ground. Very good. So he describes all kinds of things over here about how Gan Eden functions. So he says... Um, so what happens is that when a person lives in Gan Eden the only way to live over there is to have like a more in other words the, the, the body that we have on our souls right? what's the real you? is the real you the body or the soul? the real you is the soul right? the, the, the body is just a clothing for the soul you know what I mean? so what happens is that once a person goes to Gan Eden he has to have a different clothing over there, because over there it's a different kind of a world. It's more spiritual, less physical. So therefore, he has to first remove his 
right, physical clothing, which is the body, and then he gets over there a different kind of clothing, which is more suitable for Gan Eden, you know? Well, that's the idea. So once a person finishes his life over here, the, the eventual goal is to go to Gan Eden, you understand? But the problem is that if a person has sins, you know, so he can't go straight over there. You know what I mean? Because he's got to be cleansed first. So therefore he's got to go first to gain now. That's the idea, right? In order to cleanse him, to get him ready for Gan Eden, most people need to first go to Gainah. This is the way it works. Right? Over there, they put onto you, they put you some very good clothing over there, which is more suitable for that place. So what happens is, like this. Okay, then I'm going to tell you the whole, read your whole passage over here from the Zohar Kadosh. It says, Something amazing it says, right? That the ones who are not uh, uh, yet eligible to go into Gan Eden are the ones who sinned over here in this world, right? And they didn't do Teshuvah. Teshuvah is You know? So what happens is, So what happens is that because of their sins, they don't have yet clothing, the proper clothing to go into Gan Eden. You know, it hasn't been made for them. Because the clothing that they need to go into Gan Eden is made by their merits, by their mitzvot that they do. You know? So since they haven't done enough mitzvot yet, so what happens is that the, the clothing is not ready yet. So therefore, they have to send them first to gain up. You understand? This is what happens. So look what it says over here. Look what it says over here. Nishmata azla v'kisufa legabe acharim delet levushin klal. So what happens is that now this soul, which doesn't have the proper clothing to go into Gan Eden, it's very ashamed by that. You know, he's very ashamed because everybody, you know, else he's looking at the ones that have it. He doesn't have, you know, the haves and the have-nots. You know what I mean? So he becomes very ashamed like that. He has to be there like that, you know, and making a mockery out of himself. And this is what happens. So he goes, goes on further to, to describe it. Right? He says, So what happens is he's going to be judged first in Gainam, as we said. In order, to, in order to get cleansed from all those sins. So what happens is like this, right? He says that, something interesting, that the, that fire which we have in the earth, which is the Gainam, it comes actually from a different source. The, the spiritual source of that fire is the heavenly place where there's some, some kind of a river over there, something spiritual there, which is made out of fire. It's a river which is made out of fire. And from that river comes down to the earth and makes the fire in Gainam. So it's like a spiritual concept, you know, which comes down and corresponds to the fire, the physical fire that we have in Gainam. That's the way it works. So he's telling you right what the source is, and then he tells you a little bit about how it works over there, right? How it functions the whole the whole, the whole situation. So it says like this. Um, look unbelievable, this is unbelievable. So he says there are some who are placed in Gainam. You know, and what happens is that they like start to scream and yell, you know, ah, you know, like, you know, just, you know distress, you know, distress call. Ah, help me, you know, get me out. You know, because the pain is so great. As we said, 60 times more than anything over here. So the pain is very acute. So what happens is that they, they call out, you know, and uh, they're answered. So what, is that? what does that mean? Because they called out, it removes them from there because of the distress that they have. You know? So he says, right? So it says, who's the one who's Zohe, who merits to get out of Gainam when he starts to scream like that? In other words, he doesn't have to spend over here, over there a year, like most people. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about people who didn't do Teshuvah, but they were thinking to do Teshuvah, you know? They had it in their mind. You know, can you imagine? In other words, it's always in the back of your mind, you know? Like, oh, I'm thinking about, maybe I should become religious, you know? Maybe I should abandon this bad way. So it looks like I'll be <laughs> Okay, <laughs> right? So they were thinking about it, you know? So what happens is that these thoughts are so profound that once a person starts to yell over there and gain them, you know, distress call, they take them out of there because of that. So what does that mean? A person who did total chuba, he doesn't really need gainam. You know what I mean? He totally he was absolved from all his sins. There's no reason for gainam. But a person who didn't do chuba, he was thinking to do the chuba. 
So he has to go, you know, and then once he starts to scream, they take him out. So, right, it says over here in, in, the, in the Mefarshim, in the, in the commentaries over here, it's something amazing, you know, you see from there how merciful is God, you know, that a person who has all these sins, he didn't really do Teshuvah, but because he was thinking to do Teshuvah, he was removed from Gainam just because of that. This is a very big mercy from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know. You can't beat that, right? It's a very good deal. What can I tell you? It shows that Kadosh Baruch Hu is very merciful. Yeah. You know, that's the idea. Okay. You never told me about that uh, when, when you were telling me <laughs> I had one foot here, one foot there. It would have put my mind to rest. <laughs> okay. So, uh, it doesn't, by the way, it doesn't sol- uh, uh, solve all the problems. No, you should no, know. I'm sure it doesn't. does not. The, but God anyway, has a catch. yeah, there's always a catch there. You should know. Uh, right? Uh, so that's, that's one thing. So the Apostle said that the Apostle said So it says, right, look how merciful is God, as we said, right? That even though he was thinking to do Teshuvah, he never really did it, even though, nevertheless, he never did it. But still, Kadosh Baruch Hu saves him like that. Can you imagine? Right? So it says, um, uh, and he died before he really actually realized it, to do Teshuvah. You know, there are some people, by the way, this happens to them. You know what happens? The last day of their life, they want to do Teshuvah. You know, like when they're on their deathbed, you know, oh, they're thinking, ah, oh, ah, oh, I regret so much, you know what I did. So he's thinking to do Teshuvah, but he didn't have a chance until he died. He passed away, you know, before he was able to say anything. Because if he would have said, I do Teshuvah, that would have also been good. You know, just, he would have done like a confession right there on the spot. Aviti chatati pashati. He didn't get a chance to do that. He died, expired beforehand. But nevertheless, the fact that he had those thoughts will remove him from there. That's what it says in the Zohar Kadosh. Unbelievable, right? Okay. So it says, And he said, So he said, And he said, And he said, And he said, So what happens is, right, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu makes him a special place in a, one, of the, one of the chambers of Geinam, which is called Sheol, right, which is like something really bad, whatever, and one of those chambers. So he screams out from there, right, starts to scream, help, 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 starts screaming, right? Uh, I have the, to remember to scream. <laughs> Okay. I have to remember the scream. Okay, so that saves him, right, as we said. And then he says, Right, right, right. So what happens is, right, that uh, he comes to that place, uh, that, that, that wicked person who never did Teshuvah, even though he had thoughts, right? He did, right? So what happens is that he now says Teshuvah over there, in Gainam, you know? He, he, does, he does a confession over there, and that's what gets him out. He's able to confess over there, while he's in that fire, right, whatever, mm-hmm. and it gets him out from there. That's what the Sarah Kadosh says, right? Something unbelievable. Okay, very good. So it says the Kadosh, you see from there, something amazing, right? An amazing concept. That no good thought ever gets lost. Mm. Every good thought that a person has, even though it didn't come to fruition, that also has a lot of power. You know, so you see from there, by the way, how how profound the mind of a person is, you know? That every every thought that he has also has a great deal of power to, to, to do, do all kinds of things. To actually save him. Absolutely, right? And all kinds of things. All kinds of issues. Okay. Very good. Rabbi, you're not going to be there with me, so uh, I have to ask somebody, maybe Jimmy, to uh, scream <laughs> over there. Okay. Okay, now, look, it tells you, right, also another amazing thing Zorak says, right? What we just said now, that thoughts are fro- so profound, that's talking about good thoughts, yeah. right? What about bad thoughts, right? In other words, a person has, like, dirty thoughts, you know? Okay, t- sinful thoughts, you know? He's thinking about doing this sin or doing that sin, you know, fantasizing about all kinds of sins, you know, thinking about this, thinking about that. What does that do to a person, you know? So it says, something amazing, right? 
it says that really bad thoughts, until they come to fruition, they don't really do harm to a person. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That he was thinking to do a sin, except one exception. Right? There is one sin that if a person thinks about that sin, even though he didn't actually do it, it destroys his soul. What is that? Idolatry, right? He's thinking about another God, you know, thinking about Yeshu, Yeshu, you know, this, uh, all kinds of things, you know, this God, that God. He's thinking that that's the God, you know? Even though he actually never worshipped, you know, Yeshu or some other God, but the fact that he thinks about it, you know, that he's God, this also destroys his soul. You know what I mean? This is the, also a form of destruction. So therefore, right, a person who does that, even though he never actually did idolatry, the fact that he thought these thoughts, and he didn't do Teshuvah on these things, this destroys his soul, you know? So bad thoughts are only relevant for two purposes. One is that, actually, the problem is like this, right? Sometimes when a person has bad thoughts, it can also, it can also bring him to do the deed itself. Because, you know, first he thinks about it, he fantasizes, and then he goes and does it. If it went that far, he's going to be punished for that, obviously, right? But let's say just he had bad thoughts, but he didn't do the sin, you know? So there, only if it's idolatry, he's going to get punished, you know, greatly. But for the other kinds of thoughts, he won't be punished for that. That's what it says in the Kadosh. There's different ways to explain these things, by the way. All kinds of ways to explain it. But this is what it says over here in the Kadosh, right? And it seems to be very credible, very, right? Very uh, strong, very, very, uh, very profound. Okay, very good. So, uh, but it says over here something amazing, right? That if a person was thinking thoughts of idolatry, he'll never come out of Gainam. Can you imagine? This is strong enough to keep him in Gainam forever. You know, as we said, right? Boiling excrement. This is what happens to a person like that, who thinks yeah. the thoughts of idolatry. He didn't do Teshuvah on these things. You know? But he was yeah. uh, excommunicated. Yeah. He was killed also. He was, ex- from, he was executed. From, no, no, from the yeshiva. Yeah. You yeah, remember, and he was thrown out. Yeah, they threw and, him out. And there's that uh, lesson that we learned. Right. That you should. Right. You should be careful about you, people you like that. Be careful. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised he wasn't. You know, given more lenience. You know what it is. Uh, uh, you know what the story is, right? I, I, I'm sure you remember, right? We said that it says in Gemara that the rabbi went to bring him back. You know, and he said, "I don't want to come back." Oh, right? he did. Yeah, okay. he did. Yeah, I didn't know that. he went to bring him back. So you know what it says, right? Come back to the Shuvah. I'll take you back to the yeshiva. So he told him, I can't do that. So he says, why? So he answers him, I already learned from you that a person who causes others to sin, they don't allow him to do the Shuvah anymore. He already caused other people to sin, you know? He opened the church, as we said, right? He opened the reform synagogue, right? Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. So therefore, he already caused people to sin, so therefore he didn't want to come back anymore. I didn't know that he was uh, yeah, uh, yeah. welcome to. Yeah, he, he, he asked him to come back. But it was already too late for him, you know? He already went too far. That's the idea. Okay, whatever. There's also other, other stories like that with other people as well, you know, sure. that, that are mentioned. Yeah. You know, besides him. Same concept, you know, same idea. Okay, whatever. So anyway, right, uh, what happens is that a person like that never comes out. So it says like, right? What he says over here, we already described it, so I'm going to go on. He says, Uh, So it says something amazing, right? We just mentioned right before, a couple of minutes ago, we said that the way it works is like this, right? That the fire of the Geinam is fueled from the fire of the Yetzahara, which we have. So it says, right, that there was one time where the Yetzirah was nullified in the world. There was a certain period. And you know what happened? Gainam also, right, was cooled down. There was no fire over there. So they saw from also from there that the, the, the fire in the Gainam depends on the fire which is in our hearts, the Yetzirah. That's where it's fueled from. So therefore, if one doesn't exist, the other one also doesn't exist. One, one depends on the other. Right, that's what it says. Okay, let's go a little bit further. This is very amazing... Very, very fascinating uh, Zohar over here. Right? Uh, so it goes on to say, Shiva Pitchin Minu Beginam. So it says, there are seven compartments in Gainam, right? Depending on the severity of the sins that a person did, they take you deeper, you know, over there, you know? Uh, deeper and deeper, go down into the dungeon, more and more and more and more, God forbid, right? What happens is like this, right? So it describes you, what they are. So he says, those are four, seven types of sinners that are in the world. Each one gets, according to his sins, right? the proper compartment that he deserves. That's the idea, right? 
So he goes on to tell you, these are the names of the compartments over there. They have the names also. You know, each one has its own name. Right? The first one is called Ra. Ra means bad, right? Belial, which means like low life. Right? These, these are the names of the compartments. Chote, Rasha, Mashkit, Letz, Yahir. Right? These are the ones that are uh, uh, the comp- they have seven compartments of Gainam. Each one represents a certain kind of a sin that a person did. So each one gets according to his sins the proper compartment as he deserves, as we said, right? That's the idea. So then he goes on to say, uh, also he says there are angels that are appointed for each compartment to punish people over there according to their sins. So there are angels over there who do their job, you know? Torture, you know, all kinds of torture, all kinds of punishment, all kinds of things. Right? How does that work? Because they, uh, they went to a place where they, uh, right, they, uh, they, which they deserved according to their sins. So it goes on to say uh, that there are thousands of angels over there, and tens of thousands, which are doing the job, you know, to punish people over there for the, the particular sin that they did. Sounds like the movie Hellraiser. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whatever you say. Okay, so uh, let's go on. Esha de Gainam le Tata Mate Migo Esha de Gainam le Bailea. We already described this. Umate le Hat Gainam de Tata, Vito Kadbao. So it says, Ata it de Gainam de Vedarga Taman de Kun Soaro Tahat. Oh, so this is exactly what it is. Look what it says. Right? Unbelievable. There is a compartment in the Gainam which is called boiling excre- excrement. Right? As we said, right? That's the where he, where he is, your friend over there, right? Over there. And also, this friend will be there also. So, <laughs> this is your friend also. Yeah. So, what's, what's going to be over there? So these are like the big sinners, you know, major leaguers, you know, the ones who like went too far, you know, like all the way. Sin themselves and all cause others to sin also, you know, spreading heresy, spreading lies, you know, all kinds of things like this. <laughs> That's exactly the idea, right? That's called boiling excrement, that, that, uh, that area over there. Right, it says over there, so it says, So there are, it says, like very heavy sinners, you know, who never like had thoughts to do Teshuvah, you know, like they just like went all the way, you know, like no, no, no bounds, like no boundaries. They crossed all the red lines, you know, they went too far, you know what I mean? So people like that, the Chatu Vechetiwa Hananim. They sin and they cause others to sin as well. You know, they start to spread all kinds of lies, all kinds of heresy, all kinds of stuff like this. So what happens is, right? Uh, so it says, They never come out of that, right? The excrement. They stay there forever. Why is that? Because their sin is too heavy. There's no way to, 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 to rectify them. You know what I mean? You can burn them all day and night. They still, it won't become kosher. You know, it doesn't become kosher. That's the idea. Uh, that's the idea. So all those he says who went like too far like that, they're punished for like all generations. You know, like it just goes on forever, never stops. That's the idea, right? It's a, it's an ongoing thing. So over here he brings over here the uh, the commentaries who talk about this. They say something interesting, right? There is something similar to that. Uh, you know, which is also very heavy. What does that mean? A person was like masturbating, you know, like he, he likes to, you know, whack off, you know, he likes to whack. So what happens is that uh, they say that a person like this also, the sin is very heavy, right? It says in the Shulchan Aruch, the biggest sin in the Torah is masturbation, right? This also applies, by the way, to somebody who has relations with a woman, you know, and comes outside, you know, instead of coming inside, comes out. It's also like a form of masturbation. Mm-hmm. That's the idea, right? So he says like this, that uh, those people who are judged for that sin, there is teshuva for them. You know, it's not as bad as what we just mentioned over here. In other words, there is a rectification. What does that mean? If that person did teshuva about you know masturbating, so he won't be held. He won't be held out. As we said, right? The person who did this kind of sin, he caused others to sin. Like Yeshu said, right? There's, they don't. They close the doors for him. They don't allow him to do teshuva anymore. The damage already, is already too great. You know what I mean? So he has no chance to teshuva. But the one who was masturbating, say the, over here, the, uh, the Mepharshim, commentaries, he can do teshuva. He's not totally closed out. How they specify that. Yeah, all these things. Yeah, yeah. 
he's not closed out, you know, totally, because he didn't cause others to sin. He didn't really like, go that far. He was just a sinner himself, you know what I mean? He, he masturbated, whatever, a lot, whatever it is, or a little. So what happens is that if he does teshuvah, there is a way for him to, to save himself, you know? you know? So there is hope for a person who was doing the things, sins like that. He can still come back in. Yeah. But a person who went that far, you know, like uh, Yeshu, you know, that's already too far. Sounds like uh, most of society is going to help. <laughs> okay, so uh, now this is also another amazing thing. It right? goes on to say another amazing thing, which is that it's very well known, by the way, that what happens is that on Shabbat and Yom Tov, you know, Kaidre, you know, holidays, the Gainam does shut down, they shut it down. So the sinners over there who are, are there on Shabbat, they get rest. You know, they tell them, you know, okay, we're giving you 24 hours, you know, parole. You know, they give them like a, you know, a little, uh, like a little vacation. Even the worst. Huh? Even the worst of them. Right. We're going to see now exactly what, how, what, how that works, right? Who, who it applies to, who doesn't apply to, whatever. So what happens is that the Gainam is shut down at that time. The fire of Gainam is shut down. Once Shabbat comes in, the fire is shut down. And then once Shabbat goes out, they light it again. That's the way it works, right? So they get 24 hours of rest. Those people over there, sinners. But nevertheless, right, it says Kadosh, who does that apply to? That applies to regular sinners. You know what I mean? Whatever. But the people who used to be bigger sinners, what does that mean? They didn't keep Shabbat. They didn't keep the holidays. So what they do is they burn them also on Shabbat and holidays. In other words, just like they took no rest on Shabbat, so he says, we're going to punish you also. You get no rest on Shabbat. Right? You get punished also on Shabbat and Yom Tov as well. That's the idea. Right? So it says over here in the Gemara, in the Zorak, there's something amazing. It says, right, there's two categories over here. There is a Goy, right, uh, who never kept Shabbat because he didn't have to keep Shabbat. That wasn't his religion. You know what I mean? So that's one type of person who didn't keep Shabbat, a Goy. But then you have a Jew, you know, who's commanded to keep Shabbat, didn't keep. You know what I mean? So which one is worse? The Jew is worse. You know, because he was commanded to keep Shabbat. The Goy was never commanded. So what happens is that the Jew gets punished here more than the Goy. What does that mean? The Goy rests on Shabbat, you know, in Gainam, but the Jew doesn't. The one who broke Shabbat, the one who broke the holidays, he doesn't rest because he was supposed to rest and he didn't rest. So also here they don't give him rest. I, uh, I thought that uh, they had two different worlds to come. What does that mean? Ah, yeah, this is not the world to come. This is Gainam. This is punishment. You no, know no, I mean? even, even, even uh, in, in so-called hell. Yeah. Uh, it's it's all one. It's, one, it's all one. one. Yeah. There's, there's chambers over there. That's something else. You know what I mean? For kind of sins that people did. There's different chambers. But it's all one big building. You know what I mean? One big neighborhood. But there's different streets and avenues over there. You know what I mean? Different, uh, I different compartments. That's the idea. Okay. So, uh, that's the idea. Bechol Mare Shabta Kad Yom Kadash. So as we said, right, the sinners have rest on Shabbat. But the ones who didn't keep Shabbat, as we said, right, it doesn't, doesn't rest, they don't rest at that time. Very good. So uh, it's not so good, but what can we do, right? Unbelievable, right? So he says something unbelievable, right? When these sinners get rest from, from you know, on Shabbat and Yom Tov, what they do is they give them an option, you know, to see, to, to go and see the ones who are being punished even on Shabbat. So they, they can say, they say, tell them, you can go and watch them, you know, and see what's going on. So they look over there, right? And they see these people who are, even on Shabbat, they're being, they're being punished over there. Why is that? Because they didn't keep Shabbat. So therefore, they're being punished there on Shabbat as well. That's the idea. So they see that and they're in shock. You know, these people, they say, wow, this guy was even worse than me. You know, like I'm being punished six days a week. This guy's being punished seven days a week. And he's, he's in a worse, worse shape than I am. Hashem Rachem. Hashem have mercy on us. Okay, so uh, let's go on. Uh... So it's, it's unbelievable, right, what he says over here, which is that this goes on, this whole right, process that we just d- d- defined, goes on for one year, as we mentioned, right? Why one year? What's the reason one year? Because that's the time that, um, that a person is punished in Gainam. After one year, it's over. Why? Why only one year? 
because it says in the Zohar Kadosh over here something amazing, right? How long does it take for the body to rot in the grave? It takes one year also, right? That's the idea. So what happens is that once the body has already been consumed by the, you know, the worms that eat their body, you know what I mean? So all you have left over there is bones. You don't, the flesh is already consumed in one year. So what happens is that that flesh is which, once the flesh is consumed, the punishment of Gainam is also stopped at that time. That's the idea, right? So they stop it at that time. So this all corresponds into one thing, right? As you see. Why do we say Kaddish for a year? What's the reason why? Because the punishment of Gainam is for a year. And also the body takes one year for the body to rot. So these are all corresponding one to the other. That's the idea, you know? And that's the reason why everything turns out to be the way it is. But as we said, right, this applies only to people, the regular people, you know, the more like a garden variety. Yeah. But if you have people, if you have people who are, uh, you know, as we said, the bigger, the bigger sinners, the big leaguers, yeah. they stay over there longer than a year, right? They stay there forever. That's something else. Right. A different story altogether, right? So each one has its own uh, predicament. Okay, very good. Uh, so it says over here like something like this, right? That once this year is up, so then what happens now, right? The din of Gainam is over. Purgatory is done. So what happens now? So it says, depending on who you are, right? If you're like the garden variety sinner, so now you can get out and go to Gan Eden, right? You have now a chance to get into the good place. Because you've already been punished for your sins. Everything has been right, done and finished with. That's one, that's one option. What about, what about the ones who already right, are, are worse than that? So it says, right, that there are ones who were like more heavy sinners, you know? Not as heavy as the ones we just mentioned before. But they're more heavy, you know? They, like the sins were, were ever great. So what happens is that they have to be punished also with all kinds of things after that as well. What does that mean? That they're going to come to the world to come in a very lowly level, you know? Like to be the dust of the earth, you know, like very lowly, very downtrodden, you know? So they won't be like in the, in the main society over there. More like, you know, they just go there uh, like as a to be like a subcategory, you know, a subset, you know, some kind of a right, subsidiary of the of the people, tzaddikim, of the righteous over there. So they turn out to be very, very, right, very uh, degraded over there. So they're punished with degradation, like what they call that afar le raglav. What does that mean? They're like the dust of the earth, the tzaddikim over there, you know, dust, the dust under, under their feet. That's the idea. So everybody gets whatever he deserves after that, right, according to his own predicament. That's the idea. Like each one according to his level of sins, level of merits that he has, and so forth, so on. Okay, so then he goes on to say, So it says, you see from there, by the way, that it's very, very good that when a person, Lo'aleinu, is buried in the ground, that his body should decompose very fast. You know why? Because then the punishment will be shortened. Because the punishment only goes on until the time the body decomposes. You understand? And this is the reason why we have halakha, you know, in, in the Torah, that the, the halakha says, when you bury a person in the ground, you're not supposed to bury him in a coffin. You're supposed to bury him straight into the, in the, into the ground. Why is that? Because then he gets de- decomposes much faster. As opposed to being in a... In a, so right, we, did, in a right. we did away with that. Not that we did away with it, but there are some countries which have a law which you can, that you cannot bury them without a coffin. Yeah. So in order to solve that problem, what do they do? They make like holes in the bottom of the coffin, you know? So, so there is some connection to the earth. They make holes under it. You know, they shouldn't be totally closed. Because if it's closed, it's a problem. You cannot bury it like that. So they make like a compromise, you know what I mean? They put it in the coffin because of the local law, and then they open up in the bottom holes so they should be connected to the earth as well. You know, but the truth is, if it wasn't for that law that they have in some countries, it's better to just bury him straight into the ground, you know, without any coffin. Without anything like that. That's the idea, right? That's what it really should be. Uh, Hashem should save us. So, um, so it says over here like this, right? That there is no tzaddik in the world, almost, right? You know? 
who doesn't have din of gainam. He has to go, as we said, right? He has to see something over there. He has some business over there, whatever it is, right? And he says, only the ones who are like big Hasidim, you know, big, like, you know, very, very righteous, very pious people. You know what I mean? I'm not talking about the ones they call Hasidim over there in the, those neighborhoods, right? I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the people who are really, you know, saintly and pious people, right? They're, you know, they're very, very righteous and they have special, special merits. So what happens to people like that, by the way? You should know that the real tzaddikim, the real Hasidim, you know what happens to them? Their body doesn't rot in the, in the ground. It stays like totally whole. There were some cases, and you should know, that they uprooted, you know, some bodies that were like big tzaddikim, big rabbis, and they found the body totally whole. It wasn't consumed whatsoever. There were actually documented cases like that. And the reason is because these people are so righteous, they're so holy, right, that even their body is like totally like sanctified, you know. So the Yetzirah has no power. But you should know, by the way, the, the rule is, according to Zerah Kadosh, according to the Kabbalah, that, uh, you know, there's two parts of the body, right? We have the flesh and we have the bone. So the flesh is, belongs to the Yetzirah, you know. This is what causes the person to sin, you know. All those uh, pounds, you know, those extra pounds, we go to those restaurants, you know, whatever. That's the Yetzirah. <laughs> you know what I mean? The evil inclination. That's why it's not good to have, not good to have too much. You know, too many pounds, extra pounds over there. And that's the idea. Because that's all belongs to the Yetzirah. So what happens is that when you go, a person goes into the grave, whatever it belongs to the Yetzirah, he takes everything from there. You know, he takes all the flesh. He leaves the bones. Because the bones belong to the Yetzirah Tov. Understand? So he cannot consume that. So therefore, the bones remain, you know, in a longer period. Some part even, some part even belong, remains forever. But when it comes to the tzaddikim, the real, you know, extra, extra righteous people, their body does not decompose in the ground whatsoever. You know? Nothing can touch them. Nothing, they're untouchable, you know? Uh, that's the idea. Okay, very good. Also, another thing he says, right, we'll finish up with this. It's another amazing thing, right? You were just talking about this before we started the class. Which is, you know, you were talking about buying an apartment in Israel, you know, Ashkelon, you know, Ashdod, you know, whatever. So, what's the, what's the advantage of being there? There's many advantages. But here also brings another advantage. You know what it is? That when a person dies in, in the diaspora, who takes his soul? The Satan, you know, comes and takes his soul. That's the angel. The angel of death is Satan. But over there, in Eretz Israel, Satan cannot take people's souls over there. Because he, no, he has no rule over there. Eretz Israel, Hashem rules there directly. There is no intermediary. So therefore, who comes and takes the soul over there? The... the the angel Gabriel, right? Gabriel, right? Gabriel comes. <laughs> right? Gabriel comes, but Gabriel, it's good. You know why? It's better than Satan, because Gabriel is a merciful angel. You know, so therefore he deals deals with you more mercifully. He takes your soul, right? So therefore, the advantage. This is one of the advantages of being in Earth as well, that the Satan doesn't have any power over the person to take his, his soul over there. The Gabriel takes it, which is much much better. So then the, over here, the Zohar asks, asks a question. Right? Ah, so then what are you going to tell me about Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron and Miriam? What are you going to tell me about them? Right? So what's the question? The question is like this, right? It says in the, it says in the Torah that they didn't die the, the, you know, from the angel of death. So what happened? Hashem came, right, and gave them the kiss of death, you know, the kiss of death from Hashem, which is a very pleasant death, you know, a very simple, very painless death, right, very, you know, heavenly kind of thing, you know, very exalted, this is the way they died, Moshe Rabbeinu and Aharon and Miriam. So, uh, so Gemara asked a question, right? But wait a second, you told me, right, that in Eretz Israel, the Satan doesn't touch them. Ah, but you see also Moshe Rabbeinu and Miriam and, uh, right, and Aharon, they didn't touch them. So then, what? All the people in Eretz Israel are equal to Miriam and Aharon and, and Moshe Rabbeinu? They're equal? Even the sinners over there in Eretz Israel are equal to these three? So, so says the Kadosh, no, not the same thing, right? You have to, Get everything straight, sort it out, right? The way it works is like this. As we said, the ones who are in the diaspora, outside of Eretz Israel, right? Los Angeles, you know, Paris, whatever, whatever, all those places, right? What happens is that Satan comes and takes their, their soul when they, when they have to die. And he's more like cruel, you know? He's more like, you know, Ubeduria, you know? So he, you know, for, we don't want to deal with this guy. You know what I mean? But when it comes to Eretz Israel, Malach Gavriel comes, right? Gavriel comes and like, takes, takes the soul, so what happened with Moshe and, and uh, Miriam? See, it wasn't Gabriel who took their soul. It was Hashem directly who took their soul. You know what I mean? So that's a higher level. It's not the same thing. So you can't compare the ones who live in Israel to Moshe Rabbeinu and Miriam and, uh, right, and, uh, and Aaron. 
those were taken by Hashem Himself. It's a different story. It's a different, different level. So a person has to know, right? These are not all the same thing. But nevertheless, you see from there how great Eretz Israel is, right? That it gives you all these uh, merits, right? Uh, all these advantages, right? All these uh, benefits that you get over there. Okay, very good. Um, so, what else do we have over here? So, right, we'll finish off with this, right? So, therefore, it concludes the Kadosh that this is the greatness of Miriam and Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron. What does that mean? That even though they were in the diaspora when they died, they were in the desert over there, they were not in Eretz Israel. But nevertheless, because they were had such great merit, they, they, they were the leaders of the Jewish people, the ones who taught them Torah, right, they gave them zechuyot, right, merits. Just the opposite of what Yeshu did, right? Yeshu destroyed everything. He destroyed everybody who came in his path. These people built everybody, you know what I mean? Just the opposite, right? So what happened was, because of that, they died a very good death. You know, even though they were in the diaspora, they were zochet, they were merited to die a death straight from Hashem, right? With no pain, no, right, no, no suffering. A very, very pain, painless death without any, right, without any issues. So you see from there the great uh, merit of the, the leaders of Amisrael, the holy leaders of Amisrael. So, by the way, you should know, right, as we know, the Zohar Kadosh tells us that Mashiach, you know, who is Mashiach? It's Moshe Rabbeinu. So it's very basically, right, it's like, you know, uh, a second coming, if you will, you know? Moshe Rabbeinu will come back and become the Mashiach. That's the idea, right? That's the, uh, right? That's the way it is. So, therefore, we're waiting for Moshe Rabbeinu to come back, the one who had the great Zachut, to lead Am Yisrael in the beginning, to save us there. He's also going to save us from here as well, from all the places that we are now, right? Whether it's here, whether it's in Eretz Israel, whether you're in, right, in uh, New Jersey, Bayonne, New Jersey, or uh, right, Jersey City, or whether you may be in Ashdod or Ashkelon, wherever you are, he's going to save you anywhere you are. Hashem HaKadosh Baruch will come and save us all with the coming of Mashiach, which is Moshe Rabbeinu, the soul of Moshe Rabbeinu. Amen amen amen. Chazak Baruch, thanks for coming. All the blessings. Amen, amen. We should be safe from all these uh, punishments and be only uh, right in good things. Amen. amen, amen. What was with him over here coming here at uh, 10.30 at night? You got nothing better to do with this guy?